Hello, I'm Dr. John Stone, the Executive Chairman of the IgG Forward Foundation. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today, to our fireside chat. We're going to talk about viruses and vaccines today, and for that discussion, we will be joined by an infectious disease expert from the Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Camille Cotton, whom I will introduce in just a few minutes. I'd like to start, though, by reading uh, the IgG Forward mission statement. Our mission is to enhance the lives of people living with IgG4 related disease through education, awareness, and research, and to serve as a trusted source of truth about this disease. I hope you've all had a wonderful summer. Um, as we move into the fall, issues related to viruses and vaccines come up. And this is why we have positioned this fireside chat when we have in late August, right as uh, we are moving into this season. And though it seems like a bad memory uh, for all of us, the world changed uh, back in 2020. This was a headline from the New York Times a couple of years ago about how America lost 1 million people. The IgG Forward Foundation is a worldwide patient advocacy group. And of course, the losses to COVID um, across the world were much more than a million people. It was truly a cataclysmic event uh, for the human race. Uh, this part of the slide shows when the world changed in uh, February or a little bit before then, when the first cases were reported from China and then appeared in the United States. I spent 56 straight days in the hospital doing a clinical trial during that period. Dr. Cotton, who is our infectious disease expert, had her career change for all time um, with uh, the onset of that pandemic. And of course, it didn't end in 2020. It continued with the even worse Delta variant and the uh, uh, subsequent waves of uh, viral variants. And the fact is, although it has to some extent faded into the background, COVID is still around. And there are other issues related to potential infections that are very relevant for uh, the IgG4 related disease community. And our role is to be the trusted source of truth uh, for these issues. And that's why we are talking about this today. Thank you for submitting such excellent questions. Um, we uh, were gonna get through 25 of them or so. And uh, this is Dr. Cotton's picture. I'll introduce her in a minute. It's been a great pleasure to work with uh, Camille now um, for uh, many years at MGH. So we will begin uh, with a few announcements. The first, of course, uh, is the IgG Forward Jam, our first ever patient jamboree, which will be held this fall in uh, November, uh, November 9th and 10th, just outside of Washington, D.C. in Tyson's Corner. There's been a lot of information about that on uh, social media and on our website. Um, I am delighted to report we already have more than 70 uh, registrants for uh, the jam. I also uh, call to your attention or remind you uh, that the foundation um, has created a scholarship uh, program to ensure uh, that we knock down as many financial hurdles as possible to potential attendees to the jam. We want the full community's voice uh, to be present in Tyson's Corner. And you can go to this URL, um, which is on our website, and find out more information about this scholarship program, which is enabled by our very generous sponsors. So we will be talking a little bit further about the jam in early September. We're going to give you a preview of the jam. The agenda for the jam is actually complete now. It's going to be going up on our website today. All of the speakers are confirmed. We have no fewer than 18 key opinion leaders uh, from across the world, and there'll be a lot of other key opinion leaders in attendance. It'll be a wonderful opportunity for all members 
um, of uh, the IgG4 uh, related disease community to discuss and rub elbows and uh, talk with key opinion leaders and uh, and patients and caregivers. So uh, Catherine Proventure, our Director of Patient Advocacy, and I will be uh, hosting a fireside chat on September 5th, right after Labor Day, to preview the jam. We will actually be taking live questions uh, for that uh, fireside chat, and you'll be able to submit those uh, questions uh, as the fireside chat is going on. Then uh, in October, uh, Catherine will uh, host our second caregiver conversation. Uh, the first caregiver conversation back in the spring was just a spectacular uh, success with four different caregivers uh, involved. Uh, Catherine is entitling this one, Understand the Understanding the Impact of Mental Health on IgG4 Related Disease. So that will be in October. We've also instituted a question of the week now on our website uh, and on our online community and in our social messaging uh, on the right shows a figure from one of the questions of the week several weeks ago. Uh, we're now up to our ninth uh, question of the week. And the ninth one, which will be next week, um, is can IgG4 related disease be controlled by diet? This is probably the most common question that uh, practitioners get from patients um, after they've begun to understand their disease. There is great interest in how diet can affect IgG4-related disease, so stay tuned for some answers about that uh, next week with the question of the week on our online community. We also are pleased to announce that we have IgG Forward Foundation swag now. We have t-shirts uh, modeled on the right uh, here is a preview of the jam swag that we're going to have. There are t-shirts, there are sweatshirts, there are caps, and there are canvas bags that are really lovely. So if you have that person for whom you just can't figure out what to get, we're here to help that too. Uh, this is uh, what this is the gift uh, to get for that person who is so hard to shop for. More information about this will be on our website uh, in the next day or two. So with that, um, it is a real pleasure to uh, introduce Camille Cotton. This is the hospital where she and I both practice. This is the main patient tower, the Ellison building. This is the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary where so many of our patients with head and neck disease uh, are taken care of. Bart Qualish, who participated in the last um, fireside chat uh, practices here. Uh, this is the pathology building where so many of our patients are diagnosed. And around the corner is our clinic uh, where uh, patients with IgG4 related disease uh, are seen. Dr. Cotton has been uh, at MGH for more than 25 years now, even longer than uh, I have, although I'm older than she is. And uh, I have to say she is um, a, a tremendous uh, resource for those of us who take care of patients in the immune mediated disease space. There's a yin and yang between immunosuppression and uh, risk of infection. Uh, that is, you know, the reality of, uh, of how we practice. And Camille has been enormous backup to me um, in, on many occasions. Um, I well remember doing an NIH-funded clinical trial during the COVID uh, pandemic and having COVID issues. And uh, she was such a quick, uh, responded with such quick and clear uh, advice. I was immensely grateful to, to her then. And I'm very grateful, Camille, to, uh, to you again for joining us today for this fireside chat. So Thanks, I'm gonna... very... Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, I am going to uh, turn it over to you now and let you uh, run the next few slides before we get into uh, particular questions that have been submitted. Great. Thanks very much. So one of my uh, favorite areas to focus on is actually prevention of infection. Um, I think that in the United States, we do a great job preventing infections in children, and we do a lot more preventative medicine. I think that um, for many adults, 
we miss the opportunity to avoid avoid infection. So um, this is a really nice graphic that was just put out by the um, uh, National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, but uh, you can see that um, uh, adults can be protected from deadly diseases with all of the ones listed on the left. And those are all things for which we have very effective vaccines. And then on the right, uh, there's a um, similar slide for people 65 years of age and over. Um, and I would include immunocompromised people can get many of these vaccines or can be screened to see if they have um, prior infection. So um, I do a lot of work in clinic with vaccines. And I would say that over 98% of adults I see are not up to date on their um, vaccines and so are at risk for vaccine preventable illness. Next slide, please. Excuse me, okay. So just some brief updates. Um, I was, uh, until uh, the end of June, I was on the CDC uh, vaccination uh, recommendation panel. And at the end of June, we made this recommendation that everybody get the uh, new uh, COVID-19 vaccine, which will be called the 2024-2025 vaccine. Um, and that is recommended for everybody age six months and older. Um, and most people should get vaccinations once a year. It's sort of um, similar to the influenza vaccine. And... We have done a lot of focusing on people of um, all ages with moderate or severe immunocompromise. And although in general, we would recommend that you discuss this with your clinical team, um, uh, we do think that due to waning of protection after the first few months, vaccination for people who are immunocompromised every six months is likely the best approach. And so for things like my organ transplant teams at Mass General, we have rolled out a recommendation for everybody to get vaccinated every six months. I do hear some um, complaints and groans about that, um, but it's sort of akin to needing to put your seatbelt on every time you ride in the car, not just you know once in a while. It is, um, you need to maintain uh, protection against disease. And that's especially true for people that are on drugs that suppress the immune system. Camille, when will the 24-25 vaccine be oh, out? I haven't heard anything about that yet. Yeah, everybody's everybody's asking. Um, you know, it'll be out when um, our industry partners have been able to manufacture and distribute. My understanding is it will be, um, it was supposed to be late August to September, and it seems like it will likely be September. Um, but I think it should, they should be available in September and there will be the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, and then Novavax should also be out. Novavax is a more traditional vaccine platform. So there will be a variety of vaccines available. They should be widely available at commercial pharmacies or wherever you usually get your um, vaccines. That's great. I've seen very little about that so far in the in the media. So I think we can anticipate that we will be seeing a lot more of that now since it is uh, almost late August. Yes. This last bit, this last line here, I think, is something that we probably fall down on a lot in that we don't do this as 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 much as we should. I suspect that in the transplant population where the immunosuppression is just constant. Um, maybe the the clinicians are better about this, but this is something that I think uh, could fall through the cracks for our patients with IgG4 related disease. So this is a very important bit of information that we should think about revaccinating uh, patients, especially if they are on intermittent immunosuppression every six months. It's worth talking about with your with your doctor. And this slide really highlights who took the opportunity to get a booster vaccine uh, last year. So the same recommendation was made a year ago that everybody six months of age and over get a um, updated 2023-2024 COVID-19 vaccine. And um, what you can see here is in green who actually got the vaccine, and that's the percent. So 3% of people um, under the age of 49 6% of people aged 50 to 64, um, 
of people 65 to 74, it was 8%. And then of people 75 years of age and over 16%. Uh, so basically many people um, miss the opportunity to get an updated vaccine. And, you know, John, it's interesting, even in the transplant population, I have many patients that I see who haven't had a vaccine in two years. I think a lot of people were confused by the recommendations about the number of vaccines. You know, first we needed two vaccines and then for immunocompromised, there was a third vaccine and then there was another vaccine. And people come to me and say, well, I've had like six or seven, that should be enough. But because it doesn't provide long-term protection against severe disease, hospitalization, et cetera, we do need to get routine updates. So this is fairly disappointing. Um, there's definitely some anti-vaccine uh, thoughts out there, um, but I think there's a lot more to this where people, um, including clinicians, are confused by the recommendations. Um, I, I've been working with the CDC to enhance clarity and so that people can really truly understand that they should be going to get a vaccine now. That's part of the reason we made such a statement like every American should go get a vaccine if you are over the six month, over the age of six months, um, you know, this fall. So tell me if I am looking at this the right way. So th this is for uh, individuals aged 18 to 49. Mm -hmm. These were the people who had who were hospitalized with COVID infections. Mm -hmm. And of that, 78% of them had not been vaccinated. Right. Three only three percent who had been vaccinated were among those hospitalized. Mm -hmm. So younger people don't get vaccination uh, as much as, as older people. Vaccines are a little bit less effective in older people. Um, nevertheless, um, among the older group, older than 75 out of people who had been hospitalized with COVID, 48% of them hadn't been vaccinated mm -hmm. and only 16% and, and only had. Right. Yes. So you, I mean, the message of this is that you can still get sick. You can still be hospitalized if you have, if you've had a vaccination, but you're much more likely um, to be hospitalized if you right. have not had a vaccination. Right. And then there is a major problem of people not getting vaccinated. And, and, and I think it's because, as you mentioned, there, there's been a lot of confusion about this. Uh, it was new for the world, a lot of information that seemed to be changing um, all the time. And people have gotten tired of, uh, of, of vaccinations. But it's important uh, to keep on our list for, for health maintenance. I, I, fi I find this data really, really striking. Yes. So um, some of the major um, themes about optimally vaccinating people, especially people on um, agents that suppress the immune system, treatments that suppress the immune system, whenever possible, we should try to give people vaccines during periods of lower immunosuppression. So if somebody say comes into the hospital with a new autoimmune disease or a new diagnosis and is getting high dose prednisone or some other treatment that really suppresses the immune system, that's not the best time to vaccinate them. Um, so sometimes people inadvertently get vaccinated or maybe they were vaccinated two days before they came into the hospital. There actually is leeway in the CDC guidelines to repeat vaccination if it was inadvertently given during times that the immune system was being severely suppressed. And then we definitely have a recommendation to avoid vaccination right after B cell depletion. And by B cell depletion, I mean agents um, that specifically focus on B cells, things like rituximab or ocrelizumab or um, anti-CD19 or anti-CD20 agents, um, which are usually given often every four to six months. So the goal would be to sort of um, delay uh, vaccination until such time as it, they would be likely to have a better immune response. That being said, if we see people who are fully unvaccinated, like not vaccinated at all, it might be worth vaccinating them even in the setting of immunosuppression, but knowing you would repeat those vaccines later on at, to give them at least a little bit of protection rather than none at all. 
So along those lines, is it, it is it better to is it correct to think that if you've gotten a vaccine, you might get a little bit of uh, a protection, even if you have just undergone B cell depletion, or even if you're on immunosuppression, and giving it then is be is likely better than not giving it at all. Is that if someone has zero protection, you know, no vaccine and no history of recent illness it's probably better to give something rather than nothing at all um, because a little bit of protection might be, might be helpful. But yeah. I would say hopefully at this point, um, many people are, have received vaccine. Although I do see, especially younger people who haven't received vaccine, it's been very confusing. There's a lot of anti-vaccine uh, messaging out there, which, is really medically incorrect and um, really quite dangerous and a very concerning, very concerning to me as a clinician. Thank you. Yes, that is absolutely correct. It is dangerous to suggest that people should not get the vaccine. Um, and this this part that we have put in red here is really really important, um, and that's why we've put it in red. Try to avoid vaccination right after B cell depletion, or try maybe to word it better than that. Try to plan vaccination so you get uh, vaccination before B cell depletion. It, you're likely to have a much better response to the vaccine. Right, and for those getting immunosuppression, things like infusions such as rituximab every four or six months. Whenever possible, we recommend that people get vaccines just two to four weeks before the next dose. So I have many people getting rituximab every six months. And so we give um, a vaccine one month before a dose. And then again, six months later, one month before the next dose and sort of set up a routine schedule like that in that as the anti B cell effect wanes just before the next dose, that's a window of opportunity to optimize uh, vaccine response. Terrific. And then what about boosters? Yeah, so we do know that people on immunosuppression, whatever the immunosuppression might be, tend to have shorter protection, a shorter term of protection from vaccination. So we do recommend giving additional doses of vaccine um, a little earlier. A good example would be getting the COVID vaccine every six months rather than every year. Um, and then, um, yeah, revaccinating re people um, just more, more frequently um, and not uh, many adults especially younger adults might have sustained longer term protection from vaccination, but we know that older adults who actually have immunosuppression in the form of age, in that our immune system ages and isn't as robust as we head into our 70s and 80s, they could benefit by revaccination and boosters and so could people on immunosuppression. Great. And then we do have a question later on about this, but I thought it would be good to include this here about following antibody titers. What do you recommend as far as that goes? Yeah, there's been so much out there and so much messaging, and it's been really confusing. In general, we don't have, so we, we can measure antibody titers. So that's the level of antibody in your blood but it doesn't necessarily correlate with protection. We often don't know, say for COVID-19, what the threshold is that would provide robust protection against disease. We often use antibody titers, let's say for things like measles. You know, If I'm wondering if I am protected against measles, I could have a measles antibody checked and then it's either positive or negative. But we, there are very few instances in which we have robust knowledge, like really strong knowledge and understanding about what antibody titers mean. Um, we have found it, many people are, you know, they're really, um, really absolutely want titers and they feel better when they have a titer. But I will say that 
based on medical science, we don't have robust knowledge of what that indicates. We were also worried in the earlier part of the pandemic, it seemed many people were checking their titers, finding out they were high, and then going to like large parties and saying like, oh, I'm protected, and they were getting sick, and then they were dismayed. So it's sort of like saying like, oh yeah, I got my seatbelt on, it's nice and tight. Yeah, I have a you know a lap belt, a chest belt. Um, I'm belted in tight. Okay, I'm gonna drink and drive. Like, you know that it, it provides you with a false sense of knowledge, I think. And so, um, and it also adds to healthcare costs. And um, we don't use that information medically, so we don't do things like say follow somebody's COVID-19 titer and then revaccinate and revaccinate. There's not a body of evidence to show that. And the CDC still, based on all the scientific knowledge, does not recommend following titers for COVID-19. Um, and I've seen that from many other vaccines as well. So it's reasonable to check to see if it's a yes, no, like am I measles protected? Yes, no, but not the extent of the titer or the, the number associated with that. So that's very helpful. I mean, this is really a very nuanced issue. In IgG4 related disease, it's very helpful to follow IgG4 titers, IgG4 levels. That reflects disease activity a lot. Here we are talking about antibodies to the spike protein on the uh, surface of the, the COVID virus. And those antibodies, uh, as uh, Dr. Cotton indicates, can give a false sense of security. If you've got them, it doesn't mean that necessarily that you are immune to getting COVID. And immunity, we've learned, is is complicated. It's it's got more to more more to do than just with antibodies. There is a T cell, a T lymphocyte, part of the immunity that we don't understand very well, I think. And the good thing there is that even if you don't have antibodies, you may have T cell immunity. Is that is that a, a fair statement, Camille? Definitely, and it has been. That has been a real challenge in organ transplant patients. One thing we've seen is that some people develop a strong antibody response. We, we do this in a research setting. Some develop a strong antibody response. Others develop a strong T cell or cellular immune response. And some develop both and some develop neither. And sometimes there can be strong antibody, but no cellular and vice versa. So it is really confusing. And we don't know what any of that means medically. And in some ways, you know, as I mentioned, it seems a little dangerous to provide the information in that we don't understand what that means to an individual patient. And they that's why, and that's why we do recommend just staying very up to date on vaccines with um, vaccines every six months. Um, there's really strong data that um, after the first three or four months, protection against severe disease and hospitalization um, wanes quickly. So uh, that's the best we have at this at this point. I know that there's some companies that, to my mind, are a bit predatory um, that will check um, T cells and antibodies and things, and they'll take your money. But um, as a um, somewhat frugal New Englander, I don't uh, recommend that people do that. And I'm, this is something that as a doctor who focuses purely on immunocompromised patients and infectious disease issues, I do not check this. So I would encourage people to just um, don't have a false reliance on that information. So if there is a good side to this, it really is that we have learned a lot about the immune system and the immune response and vaccine responses in covid uh, just as we learned a lot about immunology during the HIV uh, epidemic starting in the 1980s, and now we've just gotten a, a new a booster um, of our knowledge about, about how the immune system works, and that's going to pay off um, in developing future therapies and, and better vaccines in the future. So let's move now to our questions. Um, those are wonderful background slides, Camille, and we'll come back to some of these points in the course of uh, discussing the questions. But here's the first one. It's submitted by a physician. My patient is desperate to travel, but I have mostly curtailed it except for, uh, except for medical reasons. He is especially anxious to do international travel, but I think that's too risky. 
I'm sure that's a question you get all the time in your travel clinic. How do you how do you respond to that? Yes, this is a great question. This is one of my favorites. Um, I have a special interest in immunocompromised people traveling and actually help write the CDC guidelines in the what's called the CDC um, yellow book, which is our travel medicine handbook. Um, and so I'm actually a support Order of people with suppressed immune systems traveling, albeit very cautiously. So I think it depends on, first of all, where they are with their illness. Are their health issues stable? You know, have they been, say, hospitalized three times in the past month? That's probably not a good time to travel because things are not stable. Um, what type of immunosuppression are they on? Are you know, is it an evolving issue and they could potentially have a high risk of getting sick at their destination? Or, you know, have they had this process for a while? Um, are they stable? Um, for me, much of the work I do would be like a kidney transplant patient who's five years out, everything's stable, stable medications, everything's been good, no issues. So, I support a lot of those people traveling and I say overall, because they are very good at their decision-making during travel, um, I've had excellent success. And actually we think we have increased safety with people who are immunocompromised traveling because they know to not eat street food, get mosquito bites, have sex with new people. You know, they're, they're um, they make good, better decisions, I think, because they sort of realize that they need to be cautious. Um, I do have a, a travel travel clinic where I see people and we discuss medications, what to do if ill at destination. Um, I do think that's a big a big part of it too. You know, travel to Europe, check your insurance, your medical insurance plan. But if you're traveling to Europe and you're hospitalized, it's probably okay. Australia, Hawaii. Um, but if you're sort of in, you know, the Amazon, you could be pretty far away from good medical care. Um, so you may wish to think about medical evacuation insurance, but even then uh, help can be far away. I'm a fan if people really want to go to a warm destination, think about the Caribbean, but the part that's close to Miami, so that if you did need medical attention, you could, you know, readily come home um, or back to, back to Miami or, um, you know, somewhere, somewhere not too far away. Um, and if you're interested in thinking about different destinations, there's a great website called CDC Destinations, and you just put in Google search CDC Destinations, and then the country of your choice, and you can read about what vaccines are recommended, um, what outbreaks there might be, uh, all kinds of things. And it's I think it's a really helpful, helpful um, guide. One of the big issues with immunocompromised host and travel is that they shouldn't go to any regions with yellow fever. Um, and yellow fever is basically sub-Saharan Africa, but not the South of Africa. Um, so South Africa is okay if you wanna go on safari. Um, and Southern Africa, there's a map actually in the CDC. Um, if you Google CDC yellow fever map, you can see where yellow fever is. Um, and then also it's in the Amazon and much of Brazil and South America. So if you look at that map, we sort of would like if people could avoid travel to that region because we can't give you a vaccine to prevent a potentially serious illness. Um, but otherwise, masking on the plane, masking in the airport, um, getting a COVID vaccine just before travel, um, those are all ways to stay healthy and strong. You can talk with your treatment team about whether they might be willing to give you um, Paxlovid or Molnupiravir if Paxlovid has drug interactions with your treatment regimen so that you could carry COVID test kits with you and start treatment if you were to get sick in a specific destination. Um, that's something I've done with um, multiple patients. And yeah, so I think there's a lot of things we can do to make travel safer. Um, you know, we're four and a half years into this pandemic at this point. So as long as people's health status is stable, I do think it's reasonable to consider travel and as long as they themselves are willing to accept some risk.
Very encouraging. And I'm really glad that you brought up the Paxlovid uh, question because I was gonna gonna ask, but thank you for uh, for addressing that. Uh, it's uh, safe to say it's wise to consult with an expert uh, in a travel clinic uh, before undertaking this, but very encouraging uh, that you don't discourage it altogether. I think people will be delighted to hear that. Let's shift the focus now. We'll come back to COVID, um, but not forgetting about another very important um, infectious disease that many of us already harbor in our in our bodies. What are your recommendations about the shingles vaccine? And maybe you could just remind our viewers exactly what shingles is. Yeah. So shingles is the chicken pox that many of us had as children. So chicken pox goes into our bodies and um, basically becomes latent or dormant or is like sleeping in our bodies. We don't, it doesn't leave our bodies. Um, and then it can reactivate and come out as shingles, which is often in a stripe somewhere on the body. It can be quite painful. Numbers that people don't usually know about are that one in every three Americans gets shingles at some point in their lifetime. And for people who have suppressed immune systems, it's closer to 50%. So very high risk overall of getting shingles. Um, there were have been two shingles vaccines developed. The first one um, was uh, called Zostavax, and it was a live virus. So that one was a one-time dose, uh, and it was not recommended for people who have suppressed immune systems because it was a live virus. It's basically the chickenpox virus that was a little tweaked so that it would act as a virus, not cause disease, but it could cause disease in immunocompromised people. But it has not been on the market for over five years in the United States because it got sort of blown out of the water by the new Shingrix vaccine. So Shingrix is a recombinant protein, totally safe for immunocompromised. For older adults, it is 97% protective for um, close to 20 years. So much better than the old one. If you had the if you had Zostavax, you still should get Shingrix. Shingrix is recommended for non-immunocompromised, 50 years of age and over. Um, I've had two doses. My husband, John, I hope you've had yours. I have indeed. Um, <laughs> and um, it is also recommended in 2021. Um, I was on the CDC vaccine panel. I was actually chairing that when we made the recommendation that anyone immunocompromised over the age of 18 should have two doses of the shingles vaccine. And um, I will say for me, it's been an amazing game changer. I used to see so much shingles. Shingles was my, oh, in medicine, we call it our bread and butter, our usual diagnosis. I would see it multiple times a week. People would have long-term pain. It's almost like a burn or like a nerve burn on the skin. It was so sad because I just saw so much of it. And sometimes immunocompromised people can get total body shingles. Once or twice a year, I'd see people that would get brain disease called encephalitis from it. So it was really bad. And then now with vaccine, I, I'm really not seeing much shingles. Unfortunately, I'm still seeing shingles in people who did not get the vaccine. So I'm really sad about that. One of the issues is when you go to the pharmacy, and I think, um, you know, this shingles for people who have Medicare Part D, Shingrix is covered and should be free if you have Medicare Part D, which is about 50 million Americans. And then um, it should be covered by many other private uh, health insurances as well. If you're over the age of 50, it seems it's readily covered. You can march in to CVS or Walgreens, wherever, com commercial pharmacy of your choice, um, or uh, go to your primary care doctor. If you're under the age of 50, but immunocompromised or going to become immunocompromised, um, you need to highlight that to the pharmacist. And I think by now, many of them are aware of the CDC recommendation, not all of them though. So some will say, now you're under 50, you can't have it. So there is, um, there is uh, information from the CDC website that just not every pharmacist is aware of, but it should, should be available, should be covered. And when I say, 
it's for people who are immune compromised, again, we would want you to get this during a period of low immunosuppression. In general, it's recommended that it be two doses, two to six months apart. If it needs to be a little longer to avoid periods of more intense immune suppression, that's okay. Um, uh, and if you, there is this sometimes a window of opportunity where people might be starting on immune suppression, but insurance hasn't approved, or there's a, a, a little time before they get their first infusion. And if that's going to be at least several weeks, that can be a time to get your first shingles vaccine or an updated COVID vaccine. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Oh, and by the way, you could get multiple vaccines at once. Initially, the CDC made a recommendation to get a COVID vaccine on its own so that it wasn't confusing as far as safety data. But at this point, we feel very comfortable with people getting multiple vaccines at, at once. And even if you can only get one vaccine before your immunosuppression starts, and then another one on immunosuppression, that's okay as well. But I would ben, say this is a really great opportunity to protect yourself against a disease for which you have a 50% risk, lifetime risk. A friend of mine had this recently, and despite being on immunosuppression, she had not been vaccinated. And um, she had months of painful neuropathy following it. So this is a, a great uh, preventive step to take. So you anticipated the next question already. Can patients get more than one vaccine on the same day? The immune system is very smart and it can sort out the things that it's supposed to make responses to and deal with more than, uh, it can multitask. So yes, you can get more than one on the same day as Dr. Cotton has just indicated. Now, how often should I get the COVID vaccine? Yeah. You know, one thing I'll say about getting vaccines, multiple vaccines on the same day, you might have more, um, you might feel a little more poorly the next day, like you might feel a little more tired or have more pain in your arms or whatever. So it's a bit of personal preference. Um, and so some people say, I have some, you know, some of my hardcore New Englanders, yeah, give it to me all, all at once. And that's fine. And then um, I talked to, I think it was my dad said, I'm retired. I'll just go to CVS once a week. I like going to CVS and getting a little outing. Okay. <laughs> That's good too. You know, personal preference. Um, so, but medically either way is safe, um, but personal preference. Um, so just then, a bread and butter question. What do you recommend in terms of uh, diminishing the, the sort of sore arm uh, that can happen after getting one or multiple vaccines? Do you, do you, do you recommend pre-treatment with Tylenol or Motrin if there are no contraindications to those? Or what are your recommendations along those lines? Yeah, um, you know, in general, most people do okay. Um, we don't think that any either Tylenol or Motrin that, that they decrease the immune response. And so Often you don't feel it the first day, um, but if you wake up and your arm's sore, you could take either, either Tylenol or Motrin if your um, clinical team says that's okay to do. You could put an ice pack on it. I don't know. For some of us, it's sort of like if it's a dull ache, I'm kind of glad that things are cooking in my arm and my immune system's having a little party and uh, trying to you know develop a robust, robust response. Um, I do hear a lot of people saying like, oh, I don't want to get vaccines because I don't want to get, you know, whatever vaccine because I'm going to feel poorly. And, you know, for example, the shingles vaccine, John, as you just mentioned about your friend, I mean, it's sort of like I'd rather have minor discomfort than major disease. And so I think we kind of need to think about our mindset um, and, and um, you know, a vaccine, uh, feeling the vaccine. I, I often get my COVID vaccines on a Friday night if I'm not working Saturday so that, you know, if I do feel kind of punky on Saturday, I can take a nap. I have a good reason to take a nap that day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but you can you can pre-medicate uh, or medicate as needed or put an ice pack on it or something like that. That shouldn't alter anything. Great. So for this one, I think we've already addressed it. How often should I get the COVID vaccine? Most uh, people should get it every year with the new vaccine that comes out. And for people who are immunocompromised, uh, they should uh, uh, maybe get it every six months. Is that a fair summary? Yes. 
talk, talk with your clinical team. This is guidance on this. There's a great CDC website. Uh, if you Google CDC uh, COVID vaccine immunocompromised, and they actually, there's a lot of fine print there um, that not all clinicians are aware of, but that's that's definitely our, our summary. Great. We'll put all of this uh, URL information in our online community. Uh, so that will be available for people to to review. Let's move on now. Um, when should patients on prednisone get vaccinations or boosters? Is there a daily dose of prednisone that makes the vaccine ineffective? Well, it's that's a good question. It's sort of one of those, um, you know, the higher the dose of prednisone, the lower the vaccine response. So if you can get people down to, you know, 10 milligrams, five milligrams, um, that's a better place for them to be vaccinated. If somebody can only come down, say, as low as 20 milligrams, and you just really aren't going to get them below that, again, some protection is better than none. So if you feel like somebody's going to be parked on prednisone 20 milligrams a day indefinitely. Um, I would go ahead and give vaccines. I would probably give some additional boosters more frequently later on, um, but sort of depends on the details of the prednisone, the clinical course. I, if people are getting prednisone, you know, 60 milligrams a day and things like that, I would really try to wait until the, the prednisone has been tapered whenever possible. Fortunately, patients with IgG4 related disease seldom require that much prednisone, and they're able to get down to much lower doses pretty quickly. So it should be possible to wait a few weeks to vaccinate patients or just to give them a booster um, at some point in the future, which they may need anyway. Absolutely. So is B-cell depletion therapy associated with worse COVID infection outcomes? We've talked about how patients who have undergone B-cell depletion are much less likely to respond to the vaccine, but do they have worse COVID infections if they get infected as well? Well, sadly, the answer here is yes, that B-cell depletion is associated with a higher risk of more severe COVID infection. One of the things we've noted, though, is now that we are able to provide many, you know, we've been able to provide vaccines um, since late 2020, so pretty amazing number of doses of vaccine, and we are seeing overall better outcomes than we were initially for people on, on B-cell depleting therapies. So we've made a lot of progress, um, especially for people who were not yet on B cell depleting therapies. So for people that received vaccine and then several years later went on to rituximab or other similar therapies, uh, they have better protection because they were vaccinated before they started treatment. So it is still a, a population that we worry about. And, you know, I will say that if I were on rituximab, I would still be careful about, you know, I wouldn't be going to crowded places or if um, if I were, I'd be wearing a good a good mask and things like that because we do see some complex lingering infections, unfortunately. So that is very important because many patients with IgG4 related disease are getting B cell depletion at least intermittently. And so what I'm hearing you're saying is that if patients are, and maybe doing a little bit of my own interpretation, if patients are within several months, maybe even up to six months of uh, rituximab, say, they need to be careful. They need to avoid going to crowded places. They should wear masks if they go to restaurants, et cetera. Is that, is yeah. that correct? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to be very, very, very clear about that. It's helpful to give clear guidance. There's a lot of uncertainty about this. And people feel well after they get treated but they're still at risk for complications of, of COVID. So it's important to be careful. Yeah, I would, and I would say be careful, but also live life. Um, there's so much outdoor dining, you know, picnicking, you can be clever and creative. Um, there is a lot of COVID out there now um, across the country. We've seen pretty significant rates. We had 1,000 deaths last week due to COVID-19. Wow. 
Um, and I know nobody really wants to talk about it or acknowledge it, but so I would be both cautious, but I also would live life, go to the grocery store, wear a mask. Personally, I like wearing a mask in the grocery store. So I don't have to talk to anybody or just doing my <laughs> own thing. <laughs> you get through the grocery store a little quicker. Um, you know, you, we can still protect ourselves, protect our, our loved ones, but I, I don't want people really um, hiding under a rock, uh, you know, the way we were in the beginning of the pandemic, because we do have good treatments. We do have a lot of vaccines. Um, so optimize, you know, optimize vaccination, wear a mask, be careful, but do do live life to the fullest um, as much as possible at this point. Okay. Remember that point too. take that one home as well. Uh, we've talked about this one already. Should patients uh, on B cell depletion get vaccinations or boosters? Um, so I think we won't won't revisit that one. Let's move on. But here are some points I think to to that you wanted to emphasize, Camille, about some CDC recommendations for people um, on B cell depleting therapy. So maybe you could just go through this too. Right, right. So for people who are getting B cell depleting therapies on a regular basis you know, every four to six months or yearly or whatever your regimen is, um, it is recommended that they get the COVID vaccines um, roughly four weeks before the next scheduled therapy. Um, sometimes it ends up, I previously had said two weeks, it's sort of two weeks to four weeks, um, but it's somewhere in that window of opportunity, it takes at least two weeks to develop a robust um, immune response, but we're hoping, we're hoping to do it just as the... Uh, treatment effect wanes in any given individual and right. again right and, and uh, revaccination right and revaccination should be considered who, for people oh you know sometimes they just they just got a vaccine in the middle of high dose uh immunosuppression um and so um they should uh get another dose of vaccine and there's actually some if your clinician says to you, oh, no, I'm not authorized or I can't give you another dose, there is wiggle room written into the CDC guidance, um, which I actually helped. <laughs> I knew that I needed John and I needed that wiggle room for to really be able to treat our patients well. And so um, I uh, made sure that we had the ability to give an additional dose. So, you know, say you go into the hospital and you just had a COVID vaccine and then you're just starting on high dose prednisone or um, uh, azathioprine or mycophenolate or tuximab, whatever it might be, um, you could get another dose, uh, say two or three months later, depending on when they've tapered your immune suppression and then probably go with vaccines about every six months after that. Great. The vaccines won't wear off. Um, you know, your body's not going to get used to it and, and stop responding. So I think that's important to, re to remember. So is immunosuppression a risk factor for long COVID? So here's another issue that we really haven't talked about, but it is a big, a big issue on people's minds. Are, are people who are immunosuppressed more likely to develop long COVID? Do we know? Yeah, sadly, um, yes, this is uh, definitely a possibility. Um, this is why I think that any immunocompromised patient who gets COVID should be treated. Um, it is pretty clear to us that treatment decreases the risk of long COVID. So if you get COVID, I think if you're immune compromised, or even um, if you have other other illnesses or other any health issues, or if you're a little on the older side, uh, I think you should be treated. I think many people should be treated and we are really missing the opportunity to treat people. Um, I hear frequently, well, it's not that bad yet. That is the window of opportunity to start treatment. Um, and so we have had a few cases that I have seen recently where somebody calls the primary care office or whatever, and they say, no, you're not sick enough, you don't need treatment. And then the person gets rapidly worse. And it's sort of like a, a lot of infections are like a fire. If it's a little smoldering flame, pretty easy to put out, right? Just throw some water on it, you're good. If it's a fully engulfed, you know, big, 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 big fire, a lot harder to put out. And so if you are immune compromised and testing positive, 
I don't want to give medical advice, but I would strongly suggest that you talk with your treatment team and ask for either intravenous remdesivir, although that's much harder to organize these days. A lot of the clinics we had for intravenous remdesivir have shut down. And so it can be hard to obtain, especially depending on where you live, um, can definitely be hard to obtain. If you can't get that, uh, the next choice would be Paxlovid, although Paxlovid can have a lot of drug interactions. So not all of our patients can get that. And then the next choice would be Molnupiravir, um, which uh, is you know widely available and doesn't have drug interactions. Um, because of the patient population that I take care of, I end up giving a lot of Molnupiravir. And I think uh, given early from mild disease, both Paxlovid and Molnupiravir are helpful. I hear a lot about um, rebound infection um, and everybody says like, oh, the Paxlovid made me have rebound. Uh, not so much. So viral infections alone often rebound. You know, remember when you had in the good old days when you had a cold and, you know, you're cold, you'd have a cold and you'd be feeling like most colds would get 75% of colds get better after a week. And then sometimes you'd be feeling better and then the cold would seem to come back. Well, that's what that's rebound, and that's what we see with viruses, whether you treat them or not. So, and some people were saying, actually, even clinicians were saying, I don't want to give treatment because it'll cause rebound, but that's like in, in really incorrect thinking. I do feel strongly that everybody who's immune compromised should get treatment for COVID. And again, if you're not feeling very sick, that's the window of opportunity to take care of business and not to wait until you're so sick that you're going to the emergency room. Two very important points. So get treated. And even if you're feeling well, get treated. Really, really important. I think we see that pitfall again and again. Yeah. So uh, how long uh, after receiving two doses of a B-cell depleting therapy, so full treatment for remission induction, um, how long is it going to be before the immune system is going to be able to respond optimally to an immunization again? Ballpark figure? It's hard to well, say for right now. This is, this is a hard one to answer. The longer you wait the better the response. I guess my question would be what's coming next? You know, is there going to be say in six months, another B cell depleting infusion? At which point that's why we would recommend, you know, in general, it um, if it's going to be six months later then at five months giving vaccines at that time. So the longer you wait, the better the response, but there's definitely a point at which you've waited too long and missed the opportunity to provide protection. I will say, so say, say somebody in uh, November gets two of these infusions, and then in late December, seeing what we always see, we start seeing lots of influenza. And influenza starts raging um, in uh, you know December, January, February. It's a really bad year. And this person uh, has to go to work in order to, you know, support themselves, have their health insurance, you know, all the usual reasons that we have to go to work. And so they're worried about exposure. Well, we know that, you know, things like masking works. Um, so that's good. I would say that in that setting, I would, even though they've just had two doses, I might give a flu shot in December. Um, you know, in the setting of intense disease activity, thinking about risk benefit. And then I would probably try to revaccinate them again um, with inf another influenza vaccine, say in like February, um, which is something that we, we do, um, you know, in high risk situations. So that would be unusual to get two doses of flu vaccine, but definitely something that we do in many uh, vulnerable populations. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so along those lines, is it reasonable to skip the flu shot this year? Had them the past several years reasonable to skip it? You know, John, I was thinking like, I haven't really used the seatbelt in my car. Like I haven't been in a car accident like in a long time. So yeah, I just went out with a pair of scissors. I cut the seatbelt out of my car. I'm, I don't need that thing, right? I get it. I get it. All right. Um, get get so, the flu shot. Yeah. So actually... Um, 
the flu shot's pretty, people think it's like, there, there's a lot of discussion about the new COVID vaccine, but actually every year we have a new flu shot. Um, and so I, I would, you know, just like COVID, stay up to date on your flu shot. I think every American uh, should get a flu shot every year. Um, we do even have, um, there was a child that died in my community several years ago of influenza. I mean, this is a bad disease. It's one of the top killers of Americans in any given year. So I would definitely get a flu shot um, every year because you want the the newest and latest and greatest and, you know, really well tolerated. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would, I know people feel like they've had a lot of protection and there is fatigue about vaccines and I can appreciate that, which is why you either go one day and just get all loaded up or spread it out unless that causes vaccine fatigue. It's important to hear a definitive answer. So that's what we have heard. Thank you. Um, has any relationship been identified between the onset or worsening of IgG4 related disease or any uh, autoimmune disease and COVID-19 infection? And I'm going to take the first stab at this one. Um, when I saw this saw this question, I did a did a, a literature search again, and I found this really interesting paper which was published in uh, the Lancet uh, journals just about a year ago in August of, of 2023. It was from China. And these investigators asked the question, um, is there an increased risk of autoimmune disease following uh, COVID-19? And is vaccination potentially protective? They studied 4 million people one million of whom had COVID and, um, and three million of whom uh, did not. And their, their conclusions were the following. And I want to see, uh, see how this resonates with you, um, Camille. The findings suggested that, yes, indeed, infection with the virus was associated with an increased risk of developing a variety of autoimmune diseases, not just IgG4-related disease, a whole host of um, autoimmune diseases did seem to be at least slightly increased um, following infection. But, and this is really the point that is so critical to our discussion today, the risk seemed to be decreased if patients had been vaccinated against COVID. So um, recognizing that there are probably no definitive answers uh, in this space at the moment, does that sort of jive with, with your understanding, Camille? Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, we don't really know what triggers autoimmune disease. We do think that infection could be a trigger, and we definitely have seen some unusual post-COVID infection syndromes. So I think to prevent, well, to prevent long COVID and then to prevent um, autoimmune disease. I don't know, we don't have data saying things like IgG4 disease is going to get worse um, from infection, but nonetheless, we do think that the risk of disease worsening or new disease is far greater from infection rather than vaccine. Um, there was, you know, some early reports in young men of um, myocarditis or heart involvement from the vaccine. It turned out that that's what happened when we gave the vaccine too close, but there was actually a much higher risk of that myocarditis or heart involvement from true infection. So if you think about risk versus benefit in an infection that has actually hit most of us by now, it turns out vaccine was a better choice um, rather than running the risk of infection. Very helpful. And clearly, IgG4-related disease was around long before the COVID uh, virus or COVID-19 um, was uh, was around. So um, I, I found this study very, very interesting. There are things that come up, though, in patients who get vaccinated. When we are vaccinating people, we are stimulating the immune system to be able to recognize uh, viruses um, so it's not surprising that sometimes um, evidence of autoimmunity emerges. And here's a patient who says, once again, I've developed neuropathies after getting a flu vaccination. Sounds like it hadn't, it, it's happened before. Can we discuss this and other trade-offs with vaccinating before suppressing the immune system with rituximab and other infusions as treatments? So it's sort of a complicated question. 
Um, how, how would you approach this? I'm sure you hear this. Yes. Well, this, this is concerning. There definitely are potential side effects from vaccines and we do see rare, um, but occasional neurologic side effects for influenza vaccine. It's somewhere sort of, um, in the realm of close to one and half a million, uh, can get certain things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, which is a, um, a type of paralysis that usually is reversible. Um, it's, I think it's all the devils in the details. So I would talk, this is a hard one to answer in general, but I would talk with your clinician, provide them with as much information as possible, and then together make a decision thinking about risk versus benefit. You know, for people that are quite able to protect themselves, um, you know, they work from home or they don't go out much or uh, so, some people have told me they love the COVID lifestyle because they're a natural hermit, um, which I'm supportive of if that's your lifestyle. Um, you know, if they um, really don't think that they're at significant risk and they're worried about the potential side effects based on their medical history, then I think together with their clinician, they can make a best decision. Um, there are some um, antiviral treatments so that say that person, say this person decides to not get an um, influenza vaccine and then goes out and over the holidays goes to, they say, that's it. I'm going to go to one family party. I'm going to take off my mask. And lo and behold that, you know, a day later they get the phone call. Oh, a bunch of us have influenza. There is a medication they could take for um, prevention of infection. So I'm really pleased to hear, and I think everyone will be pleased to hear you uh, say that things do happen from time to time, rarely uh, with with uh, vaccines, but it really is a risk benefit uh, ratio. And typically um, the benefits, the potential benefits far, are, are, are greatly uh, in favor uh, of getting the vaccine. But cases, particularly ones like this, need to be considered on an individual basis. They can be nuanced and complicated. And this is where a good discussion with your uh, care team is so crucial. So here's a two-part question. Um, we've addressed some of it before. Um, I want to know about traveling and hoteling for a person living with IgG4-related disease. And I'll just skip to the second part, too, so you might be able to summarize both of these together. Any recommendations on traveling after two infusions of a B-cell depleting agent? It sounds like you would be very cautious with regard to part two um, and, and traveling if patients have just been been treated, but um, I, I, I won't presume to answer for you. Yes, no, I agree that part two, if it's just occurred, they are at much higher risk, both for infection, but also I would wonder if, if their disease is stable, is there a higher risk of being hospitalized? You know, you, when you travel, it's really hard if you end up getting hospitalized somewhere far away from home and, you know, it's just complicated. Um, so I'd make sure optimally, I mean, I, it depends on the reason for travel, you know, if it's um, vacation travel or something that's elective, that's one thing. If somebody's loved one dies and you really want to be at a funeral or some other type of event, um, you know, maybe it's all about risk benefit, right? So maybe for the part two, they could, you know, very carefully mask, try to spend as much time outdoors, travel with treatment for COVID-19, maybe get a, um, well, it's probably not possible to boost them. For the first one, you know, it depends on how, when, what treatments they're getting in general, I'm quite comfortable with uh, like hotel rooms, I'm less comfortable with hotel lobbies and then elevators, but, um, you know, carry hand, uh, wear a mask when you're traveling through the lobbies, hand sanitizer, um, and then air, if they're doing airplane travel, mask in the airports and airplane and whatnot, um, personal car travel might be better than, uh, public transport, um, but sort of the same answer, what, what I said before about traveling um, is definitely reasonable to think about, um, depends on sort of the, the details, um, but I do think travel is an important part of life. 
So it's 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 impossible to eliminate risk in this regard entirely, but it is possible to minimize it by taking yes. good measures and important. Uh, I'm glad you reminded people about hand sanitizer and masking. Don't be shy about wearing a mask. Okay, um, I've heard of IgG four related disease being. Uh, I'm sorry, of IgG four being elevated after repeated mRNA vaccinations. Any insight into this? Let me take the first stab at this one um, too, Camille. Um, so, I, IgG. This is this is something that we that we discuss a lot. Uh, IgG four related disease. We're really confident now is not caused by IgG four. The IgG4 elevation is a response to another primary um, immune reaction that is going on. And we believe that the IgG4 is actually trying to suppress uh, that primary immune response. We know that IgG4 goes up um, in patients and in individuals who get stung by bees. We think the, the, the role there is to try to prevent um, anaphylaxis. And it really is a normal expected response to see a rise in IgG4 following a vaccination. So I would not view that as being in any way problematic. Um, I don't know whether that's something that you have encountered, um, Camille. It's something that, that I've encountered because I take care of patients with IgG4 related disease. Sure. From my standpoint, this is not, not a concern. Um, do you have a reason to think differently? No, I would definitely, definitely agree with you. We know that, you know, IgGs go up after um, vaccination. So part of that's just uh, a normal response. I guess there's a, there is a bit of a question about whether people should get Novavax or mRNA vaccination. Novavax is the more traditional vaccine platform. Here's the next, here's the next question. There it yeah. is. I knew it was coming. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think that we have data for specifically looking at IgG4 uh, related disease as to which vaccine is better. Um, we do equally recommend Novavax and mRNA vaccines as far as the CDC perspective and then the immunocompromised host perspective. We don't have um, data saying that one is superior to the other. And I know some people tell me they love um, to get all the same vaccine. They're like, I'm a Moderna. I'm yeah. Moderna. And okay, but I'm actually a mix and match. I don't know. Um, we and they've done they did some research on this. I we initially thought that maybe if you did different vaccines, you'd get maybe more robust response because you'd have picked different, I don't know, somehow it would provide better protection. That hasn't really been shown to be true, but um, I do think that it's reasonable. You can get all matchy matchy is what I call it, or you can um, get a more, uh, you know, a soup of, of different vaccines. I think both are um, appropriate. Um, so if you wanted to switch now to Novavax, that's okay. Uh, Novavax is um, not as why has not been as widely available. Um, there is a vaccines.gov website where you can find COVID vaccines on a map that was super helpful. Um, it's, it's not going to be updated yet for the 2024-2025 vaccine, but that might be helpful if you specifically want to find one vaccine over another. Great. Thank you. So there's several more questions I'd love to get through if uh, people can hang on just a little bit longer. This is really important. Um, could you comment on COVID treatment options uh, for this fall and winter? There are some new kids on the block. Um, and uh, you've given some information. You've talked about a couple of these, several of these already. Um, in particular, the first one, uh, Pim Garda. So this is um, the new Evusheld. Is that the way? Uh, is yeah. that the way? That's a good way to think of it. It is a new, so it's a monoclonal antibody to prevent um, COVID-19. It is not recommended to be used in place of vaccination unless someone has a severe uh, you know, reaction to vaccination. Um, it is uh, fairly expensive in that the wholesale price is $5,600 plus infusion costs, which could be significant. So if you are interested in this, check with your insurance company. 
It's also very hard to come by because we are no longer staffing these infusion centers and it's a one hour infusion plus two hours of monitoring because there's a risk of a low but significant risk of anaphylaxis. I will tell you that um, this could be quite useful, especially for the people that are maybe maybe haven't had vaccination and are getting um, higher doses of say um, anti-CD20 or anti B cell therapies. Um, but in general, we have not given much of this at Mass General. Um, and if you want to try to seek this out, you know, you can, many patients have had to make a lot of phone calls to try to figure out where to get this done. It's just not wide, not been widely available, unfortunately. That's unfortunate. Evusheld was very widely available at the time, and we were using, we were treating patients prophylactically with that yeah. to try to prevent infections. But that's not the case now with Pimgarda. It's not, it's only being used in a sort of post-exposure kind of setting. Is that right? Well, um, it should be preventative, like even before, even before exposure, but really hard to get your hands on. So mm -hmm. um, I think with, because we've had so many vaccines at this point, we see less of a need for it compared to when we were using Evusheld. Evusheld was also easy. You know, you just did those injections and then they sat in the waiting room for a little bit and then they could skedaddle. So this is a lot of um, infusion time and the monitoring. So um, we this is something that we have not been able to readily um, administer at Mass General. You know, the hospital is always chock full of people needing treatment. So, um, but I've heard that in Maine and Vermont and some other places, people were able to get it and it was covered by insurance. I believe that this is covered if you have Medicare Part D. Mm. Well, when this comes up, it's always an urgent situation and people are usually desperate and uh, they want to be treated regardless of whether they think their insurance will pay for it or not. So we'll have to see how this space um, evolves um, as the fall and, and winter go on. So if treated with Paxlovid, um, how soon after uh, Paxlovid can B-cell depletion be scheduled? Or is that even an issue? Uh, and then the second part of that question is, how soon after B-cell depletion treatment can Paxlovid be given? Uh, is it an issue? Can we use these uh, use these therapies sort of uh, regardless of the relationship to each other? Well, um, there's no drug interaction, so they could be given at the same time. For part one, if treated with Paxlovid, so that means that somebody has active disease, I would make sure that their active COVID-19 has fully resolved, you know, that they're much better. Like I wouldn't give five days of Paxlovid and then immediately give B-cell depletion on day six. I would make sure that all of their symptoms are better, they're stable. Often it's about two weeks and then you could do the B-cell depletion. Of course, that's an individual, you know, if somebody's really suffering, then maybe they need to give it sooner. So I don't want to give me inappropriate medical guidance, but in general, probably waiting about two weeks after Paxlovid treatment. And sometimes that might mean that um, the anti um, B cell therapy might be delayed a week or two. And in general, that's actually okay, but you should discuss with your clinician. And then how soon after B cell depletion treatment can Paxlovid be given? Um, I would say anytime. So if say somebody gets an infusion and one week later they get COVID-19 infection, they should absolutely get either Paxlovid or intravenous remdesivir or um, molnupiravir, but they should definitely get treatment if they've just had B-cell um, depletion therapy. Very helpful. Thank you, Camille. Okay. I don't want to forget about RSV. Um, when I was a medical student, RSV was a virus that seemed to occur just in kids, but it's not the case, clearly, and there's now a vaccine. So I wanted to ask you to say a few words about this, and, and you were kind enough to prepare a few slides. So respiratory syncytial virus, or just RSV for short, and vaccines, and thank you for putting these couple of slides together. Sure. So RSV is similar to influenza in that it's quite common. It happens pretty much every fall. You can see in this slide, um, there's often a peak sort of in November, December, January, February, just like influenza. The rates are overall lower than for influenza, 
Um, but it does have a significant risk for hospitalization, severe disease, and even death. Um, and we do see significant disease in people who are immune compromised. So now for the first time last year, we had, and they basically made a big scientific discovery on how to um, be able to make a good vaccine. And so they developed the vaccines. They did huge clinical trials involving tens of thousands of patients. And these vaccines overall are very good and protective. Um, I will say there's no, there's no treatment for RSV. So vaccines are really the way to go. We do have treatments for influenza. We have treatments for COVID-19, but we don't have good treatment for RSV. So um, there is, uh, we just um, published our updated um, guidance and RSV vaccines are recommended for everybody 75 years of age and over. And I would say that's a really strong recommendation where it can prevent you know, severe disease. And I hear a lot of people say, well, my mom's really healthy at 80, but honestly, um, everybody over the age of 75 and over can really benefit from this. If your mom's really healthy at 80, keep her disease free and she might even be doing better than ever. So this is a good vaccine for older folks. And then it's for people 60 to 74 at increased risk for severe RSV disease, especially people on um, immunosuppression, as you can uh, see there. Some people on this call might also fall into some of these other um, risk categories. But basically there, anyone 60 to 74 with one of those risks should receive a single dose of RSV vaccine. We're not doing repeat doses at this time. We are doing a single dose of um, RSV. Um, and there's both a um, Pfizer and GSK vaccine that are recombinant proteins. And then just this fall, we have Moderna is out with an mRNA vaccine for RSV. Um, I have seen tens of thousands of people get um, these vaccines in clinical trials. I'm very comfortable with the safety data. And I do think it's a great way to prevent one of the most common reasons for hospitalizations, especially in older adults. And John, you're exactly right. It is the number one reason that infants are re-hospitalized after birth is RSV infection. So we're now really, we have great data preventing this in um, pregnant people and newborns. Um, and it's been a game changer in the last season. Um, and we can do much better by people 60 years of age and over. Um, it is not yet approved for, um, not yet recommended for people under the age of 60. It is approved by the FDA for people 50 to 59, but not yet recommended. So it might be available to you, but you might have to pay about $400 for it. And is this um, a once in a lifetime thing or do you, it will it be an annual uh for now, that's a it's a great question. For now, it's once in a lifetime, but because it's a new vaccine and we're waiting on additional data, that recommendation may change. One of the concerns with this vaccine is we're not seeing a lot of booster effect. Um, this is one that I probably would not get if I just had like high dose B cell depleting therapy. I might wait um, until things were more optimized because it is a one-time vaccine. And yes, we're not seeing the booster effect we were hoping we would see, but that is definitely a work in a work in progress. And there's a lot of research underway. I know some people have been frustrated by the CDC changing guidance over time, but literally we are changing guidance to make things better as we get more medical information, so. Very helpful, watch this space. No doubt that it will change, but it's great to have a vaccine. Um, against this uh, against this virus now. Oh, great. Uh, and you did have something about cost uh, as well. Uh, you may have already gone over this. Yeah, it should be covered by people in Medicare Part D, and then many private insurances should be covering this. But just be aware to maybe ask what the price is before you get the vaccine. Okay, great. Um, so one more really sort of naughty uh, question. Um, I had facial edema after the second dose of an MRA COVID vaccine. Uh, then I had three boosters with another uh, mRNA vaccine without problems. But last December, I developed idiopathic edema of my lower face twice, extending towards my throat. Both events responded well to steroids. Can I take any vaccine safely? Yeah, it's hard to 
Hard to know how close the mRNA vaccines were to the event in December. If they were around that time, I guess I would be a little worried, but if they were not close, like not within a month of that idiopathic edema, um, maybe it's not related. So sort of the devil is in the details and I would discuss this with your clinician, remembering that, you know, there is Novavax. Um, and so there, there are other options. Um, I'm not, this is, isn't strongly signaling that all vaccines are risky. Um, right. And I do think it's one of those risk benefit discussions to have with your clinician. It might be a situation in which a consultation with an allergist uh, is useful because, as you point out, maybe it's not related uh, to the vaccines, not directly. Yes, that's a great idea. These kinds of issues do do come up frequently. Uh, we've already talked about this one already. This is about following vaccine uh, levels, and you've uh, emphasized that we don't don't rely on them. They can give a false sense of uh, security. So certainly doing them routinely is not uh, not indicated. And there's not really a level that is considered protective. Immunity is a little bit more complicated than just um, an antibody level in this sense. Let's see, what do we advise? And I think we're, we have one more after this one. Um, what do you advise about being around relatives who have gotten COVID? Well, so I guess if they're in the household, I would be very cautious if they have active COVID. So, you know, that's sort of within the first 10 days, assuming they're not immune compromised. I would sort of, honestly, I would be very strict for 10 days. I would probably... I would probably live in the house with them. I would mask. Um, I've certainly done this in my own household plenty. Um, you know, you mask and make sure you have good hand hygiene. But I don't know that anyone, unless you're living in a really small space, I don't know that anyone needs to move out. But I think, um, and also if both parties mask. So if it's, say, you and your partner and the partner has COVID, I would have the partner mask, you mask. And then I think uh, I would sleep in separate rooms. I would try to spend as much time as possible in separate rooms, maybe have some fans running or the window open or just air movement. But it really, that really should be okay. Um, if you're going to eat a meal together, so you have to take off your mask, maybe try to do it outside. Um, I think at one point we had a dinner where we had two children very far away in the dining room. And we were very, very far away in the living room. And there was kind of some yelling back and forth, but they had COVID, we didn't have COVID. And so we still had dinner. It was pretty okay. <laughs> An unusual family dinner, but a dinner for the, for the COVID era. The no one got COVID, no one more got COVID. None of the rest of us got COVID. Well, I love the, I love the practical advice. Um, and so for this one, this last one, I fortunately have already addressed what tests are used to evaluate the risk of hepatitis B um, reactivation, actually not infection. And the answer to that is found in this week's uh, question of the week, which you can view on our website um, here. So with that, I want to thank you, Camille. This has been fantastic. It's been everything that we hoped it would be. I know why you uh, are such a star um, in this arena and why the CDC calls you regularly for uh, for advice. Uh, this uh, fireside chat is going to be an instant classic. I'm sure it's going to be in reruns next week um, on our website. You'll be able to uh, view it again there. As I indicated, we'll put the information about URLs uh, on our online community. I'm sure that there will be additional questions, and if so, please uh, submit them to us uh, through our website. Make your vaccination plans now. You can get more than one vaccine um, on any given day uh, if you wish. Happy Labor Day, and we'll see you back here on September 5th. Catherine Preventure and I will be giving a preview of the jam. So Camille, thank you very much again for joining us today. Enjoy the last few days of summer. I'm sure you're going to have a busy autumn. Yes. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.